I want to feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want to feel friendship, companionship, love between one another, but I got to feel Jesus. Amen. I got to feel Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I've got a, a little bit of a different thought this morning, and it partially uh, ties together with what I taught Wednesday night. So those of you that play hooky on Wednesdays get to get a touch of what happens on Wednesdays. Amen. And, uh, and I'm going to encourage you again this morning, if, if you can at all, if any way, shape, form, or fashion, if you can go to Walmart on Friday night, you definitely need to come to church on Wednesdays. Can I get a witness? Huh? Woo! I felt, I really felt the Holy Ghost right then. <laughs> Do what? Yeah. Yeah. Brother McKinney said it's cheaper to come to church. <laughs> he, he's right. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I'm happy to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm happy to know that if the trumpet sounds, oh, Lord, if the trumpet sounds, I'm going to be called up to meet him. Meet the dead in Christ and him. Oh, that excites me. That excites me. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter number 18. Um. Uh, Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb of God. Oh, I, I love living this life. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. We'll, we'll wait till Brother Terry stops disrupting the class, flirting with all the ladies over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing a little bit. Yeah. Acts chapter 18. Verse 1 said, After these things, Paul departed from Athens. How many of you have ever heard of Athens? It's the same Athens you've heard of today. The apostle Paul preached the gospel in Athens, Greece. And he came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and he came unto them, Priscilla and Aquila, which you're going to find out later, Priscilla and Aquila become great soul winners. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them. He lived with Priscilla and Aquila and wrought. That word means he worked with them. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. Now, I'm a little bit inclined to, to elaborate on that, uh, but I think we'll save that for another day. Uh, we'll just save that for another day. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I need to, I guess I need to tell you all what this is for. I've only had one person ask me. How many have noticed it? I've only had one person ask me. How many wondered what it was all about and was just too chicken to ask? We just celebrated 12 years since 9-11. And when the towers fell that day, there was a young man, age 24, named Wells Carruthers. And he was at the elevator to leave and uh, ended up changing his mind. He went back and he saved uh, at least 12 people, they verified. And the way they know that he saved all of these people is that when he was a little bitty boy, just, just a small boy, and you see a picture of him as a little boy. His dad gave him a red bandana when he was a little boy, and he wore it all the time like this, you know, like, like kung fu or something. And uh, so that day, he uh, uh, put his bandana on because he carried it in his pocket with him all the time. He was a, a day trader, uh, worked in the financial area of the World Trade Center on the 102nd floor, and you've got to remember, he, he was out. He was free. He ended up being found in the bottom floor when the building fell on top of him. He was found with a bunch of firemen, but he had went back in and saved. And all of them said, we don't know who he was, but we saw a red bandana on him. 
You can look it up on the internet. Now it's a big deal. The college that he went to has a red bandana run. And, but anyway, because of the times year before last, Brother Mangan handed these out to everybody. And it, it became a symbol of just a reminder to us that we're in the soul-saving business. It's just a reminder that we've got to be willing to sacrifice our lives. And, there's, and there may not be, they may not even know our name. But there better be something about us. Not saying we got to wear red bandanas because I'm not going to because I look like a fool wearing it around all the time. But I keep this in there when I pray in the mornings to remind me that I'm supposed to be winning souls. Okay? This, Brother Burns gave me at our installation, is called a tallit. Now, remember, I'm talking about tent makers. When Jesus, how many of you remember when Jesus said, when you pray, enter into your closet? Well, here's what he meant. This is a prayer shawl, okay? And this was given by God to the children of Israel in the book of Numbers. I don't know if you remember or not, but there was a fellow started gathering up sticks on the Sabbath. And broke the law of God, and after he gathered up sticks... Then the Lord told him, I want this, this, there's a bunch of symbolism, I'm not going to tell you. But the Jews still wear them to this day. How many have seen them in an airport? You've seen them. This is a tallit, and theirs are somewhat bigger than this. But this is the closet that Jesus was talking about. This also is called a tent. And it is very good historical probability that the Apostle Paul was a tent maker in this type of tent as opposed to a tent that you would sleep in. And these are, it's, it's a, a craft. The knots on the end of it stand for, the five knots stand for Yahweh. The stripe, the, the, the windings, there are 39 windings upon each one of them, which stand for the stripes that Jesus bore on his back on Calvary. And there is much more symbolism about it. But When I'm by myself down here praying, I pray with my prayer shawl. Not that I'm a Jew or, or anything. It just, and, and there are 613, I believe, all told. You add them all together. And if you look in the Bible, there are 613 commandments that the Lord gave his people in the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers. So uh, it, it's very good possibility that Priscilla and Aquila and the Apostle Paul were tent makers because every Jewish person that desired a relationship with God would wrap themselves in one of those. They wore it under their coat. They wore it all the time, Brother David. It was symbolic of Jesus, of, of, of Jehovah. It was symbolic of his commandments, and it was symbolic of the laws that he had given out to the children of Israel. And I'm going to preach on it sometime and understand the symbolism of how, how we wrap ourselves. Remember, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. When you fall in love with the commandments because you realize, Brother Rice, that the Bible said he chastens those that he loves. He only chastens us when we break his commandments. And the Bible said, if you love me, You'll keep my commandments. And so when we truly fall head over heels in love with him, we, we want to follow his plan. Amen? So Paul has left Athens, the Bible tells us. Now, Athens is in Greece, as I said before. And while he was there, Brother McKinney, he had been invited and he accepted the invitation to speak on Mars Hill. Or Areopagus is how it's referred to in the Greek, which is the highest court in Athens. It, it was where all the thinkers and all the smart uh, theologians and philosophers would all gather. And what they would do is try to find out who had the newest bit of wisdom or the newest cool thing that they could share. And they heard Paul preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and the power of the resurrection. So they invited Paul to come and tell us what you've got going on. And, and so Paul went and, and he spoke to them of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he spoke 
of, of Jesus' knowledge of each person's life and even down to specific details. How many of you know the Lord knows the bounds of our habitation? He knows our beginning and He knows our end before we ever begin. And He is given the opportunity to witness to them of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, He got a mixed reaction when He preached the gospel. Now, let me ask you something. Think about the Apostle Paul and all that he did and the ideology, the, the bright-eyed uh, Pollyanna uh, uh, outlook that he had, so to speak, that everybody that hears this gospel is going to want to do it. Right? You hear Paul preaching. What happened to Paul? He struck down by light on the road to Damascus. He goes, Brother McKinney, and believes what the man preached to him, and he was baptized. He talked in tongues with a great deal of regularity. He was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he evangelized his whole world that he knew. And so he goes to Athens to where all these intelligent people are, the world's most intelligent people. They were so, they were, they were arrogant, they were prideful just in their knowledge and, and all they wanted to come here. Paul preaches to them the gospel of Jesus Christ and then he got a mixed reaction because the Bible said that several made fun of him. They mocked him when he began to preach about the resurrection. Now, is that not ironic, Brother Billy, that we can, we can stand on common ground with virtually every religion until we start talking about the resurrection and the essentiality of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's what happened with Paul. They, they liked what he had to hear, Brother McKinney, until he started talking about the power of the resurrection. And the average carnal mind cannot put their mind around, wrap around the power of the resurrection. When people die, they stay dead. And he preached that Jesus didn't. And when he said that, they laughed at him. But the Bible said there were a few others that desired to hear more. So Paul left that location. But there were a few that believed and stayed with him. Two of them are named, named Dionysius and Demarus, a man and a woman. And it is mentioned that others unnamed came also with them. And however blessed and however elated that Paul was to be able to speak to the Athenians, overall his message was not very well received in Athens. So he left Athens and came to Corinth. Now, the, the folks that attended church here uh, regularly and heard me do some teaching on Wednesday nights of, from Corinthians, uh, this will be familiar to you, but Corinth was an incredibly evil place ungodly and immoral to the point that they had become a byword. To say that someone lived like a Corinthian, if, if you were of low moral character and if you were a, a bad person, they would say that you lived like a Corinthian. It was an insult that spoke to the low moral character of the person that was called living like a Corinthian. The Corinthians were devoted to the Greek god Poseidon, who was the god of the sea, seeing as they drew a whole bunch of, they were a, a port city, and Brother Shannon, they drew a bunch of wealth from the sea. People would pass by Corinth, a lot of trading, and much of their wealth and their reputation came from the sea. Their main focal point, however, their main focal point of worship was Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love. There were more than 1,000 priestesses that operated in the temple of Aphrodite as prostitutes uh, using sexual activity as worship in the city of Corinth. So this is Paul's first visit to this, this terrible city. He is reeling a little bit. He's shaking a little bit because he tells the Corinthians in his epistle to them that I was with you in fear and in weakness and much trembling, if you remember. He, he's a little bit, he's, he's taking a, a little bit of a hit at Athens because he expected to share the gospel and then believe it. How many of you remember when you were first filled with the Holy Ghost and you wanted to go tell everybody about the Holy Ghost and, and just as soon as I tell them, they're all going to believe it and they're going to be right there with me because how can you not accept something so great but then when they say I'll never be a holy roller then people are nuts I went to church one time they scared me to death you, you've heard it all right and then you begin to feel yourself getting a little bit man my, man why why 
why can't they believe it? If they ever just tasted of it a little bit. If I could just get them to believe just one part of it. Just get a little taste. This is what Paul's feeling. Regardless of how he feels at this time, and this speaks to Paul's unfailing purpose and unfailing faith in his calling, he began to preach the gospel now at Corinth. Verse number 4, Brother Shannon says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So here's what would happen. The synagogue is the Jewish church. It's where they still go when they practice everything that the law says. Okay? Please try to stay with me a little bit if you can. What I'm going to share with you this morning is very important. Okay. He would go to the Jewish church. All right. And when he got there, somehow or the other, I don't know how he always did it, he got himself invited to preach. You read it throughout the Bible. He did it at Thessalonica. He did it at Corinth. He did it everywhere he went. He got himself somehow, Brother Billy, I don't know, he might have just stood up and raised his hand and said, hey, by the way, if y'all got a few minutes, I'd like to preach. Can y'all see me doing that at some of these churches here in town? Huh? It ain't happening right now. It may after I get through today. I may feel so convicted that I just start doing it. But Paul, Brother Billy, had a message. He had a revelation that Jesus was God and that Jesus had died, was buried, but he rose again. And that same power that brought him out of the grave got in Paul. And he was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost after repenting of his sins and being baptized in Jesus' name, according to Acts 22. And now he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, every Sabbath. Everybody say every. every. Paul was faithful to the house of God, even if they didn't preach the truth. Because he, he did not allow his apparent failure in Athens to stop him from preaching the word at Corinth. He did it every Sabbath. And the Bible said, persuading the Jews and the Greeks. What he was trying to do is trying to get them to believe the gospel. Which was what? That the Messiah had come. That the deliverer had come. That the anointed one had come. That deliverance was here. That, that the, the glory of, of the power was here. And you can have it. You just got to change your ways. You got to be baptized in Jesus' name. And then you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the gospel that Paul preached. Trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks. In a manner of speaking, he was trying to do what Jesus Christ couldn't even do. Because Jesus tried to tell him who he was. They wouldn't believe him either. So he's preaching in the Sabbath every day trying to persuade them. How many of you know we have a gospel? We have the good news. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are many, 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 many millions of people that haven't got a clue what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. They haven't got a clue that you can be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That you can have the Spirit of God residing within you. And it'll help you live holy and righteously and godly in this world that we live in. And that when the trumpet sounds and, the, and, and time on earth draws to an end, that it's that power that will cause you to be raptured and caught up Amen. to meet him in the air. And if I read the Bible right, Brother Pete, it so, says, so shall we ever be with them. Verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now notice the terminology there. It said he was pressed in the spirit. When Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit 
by the arrival of his friends. This is something takes place when Paul realizes I'm not alone anymore. Something takes place. There is something. You hear me right now, saint or, or guest, a regular attender of this church. There is something about the power when two or three get together. That's more than when just one gets together. Ecclesiastes says uh, that the threefold cord is not easily broken. Brother David, there's something that, that lights a fire in us uh, when, when fellow brethren, fellow sisters come together, people that are Holy Ghost filled come to support the work that we do in the ministry. Paul receives renewed vigor and renewed enthusiasm when he's supported by the brethren because he knows that the word of God has been confirmed in Silas and Timothy. He knows that the power of the Holy Ghost changed their life and it builds his faith in order to preach to those at Corinth. We can never underestimate nor discount the importance of friendship and fellowship of people with like precious faith. And in his renewed push to preach the gospel, I've got to give you a little Bible lesson this morning. And testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now here's something you've got to learn. When we read Jesus is the Christ in the Bible, the article the tells us that the intent is to declare him as the Christ, generally speaking. But when it is written without the article the, when it just says Jesus is Christ or Jesus Christ, or in this case Jesus was Christ, he is being declared to those people according to his character and his relationship with believers. He is being declared according to what he consists of and what he means to those that are hearing the word. The character of Jesus Christ as that of a Savior coming to liberate his people, not from Rome, but from sin. Paul very strongly, and you remember in the book of Corinthians, he very strongly declares his intent to, to preach nothing to them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's the message of the cross. The character of Jesus Christ, we cannot preach without preaching the message of the cross. We have no message without the cross. We have no gospel without the cross. We have no hope without the cross. We must preach the cross. We must preach the whole crucifixion. But Brother Shannon, we cannot preach the death without preaching the burial. And you can't preach the burial without the resurrection. We've got to preach, uh, and not only do we got to preach, uh, but we've got to live the power of the resurrection in our lives. Uh, we're not dead, but we're living. Uh, we're not beat down, but we're breathing. Uh, we're not destroyed, but we're on the side of the resurrected Savior. The message Paul preached of salvation was very simple. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel. That, my friends, is the gospel. And we must likewise die, which is repentance. We must be buried, which is baptism, in the only saving name of Jesus Christ. And we must rise again, which is being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Verse 18. I'm in verse 6, I'm sorry. 18 and 6. And when they had opposed themselves, that themselves is referring to Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. So they opposed, Brother McKinney, they opposed Paul's teaching. He goes to the synagogue, and on the Sabbath day, they opposed his teaching. They came against him, and they blasphemed his message. Basically, they said, you're nuts. We don't believe it. It's not true. They denied the power of the Holy Ghost. And so Paul took drastic action. He shook his raiment or his cloak, very possibly his tallit. He shook it uh, and as, as a type of, of when Jesus sent his disciples. Somebody please hear me this morning. 
Jesus sent his disciples by pairs of two and he sent them all over to preach the gospel. But he said, if they won't receive you, shake the dust of your feet off and go to somebody else. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you that ain't easy to do? But can I also tell you how many souls have we missed by continually trying to reach the folks that won't listen? Oh, God help me right now. Keep that in mind. As a type of shaking the dust off his feet, he shook his raiment at him. And he declared to them, very ironically, much like their own cry at Jesus' trial, he said, your blood be upon your own heads. And then he says, I am clean. That's referred to Ezekiel's words in the Old Testament, his words of warning to the man of God. To share the message of salvation. The Lord told Ezekiel, if I tell you to tell them what they got to do and you tell them, then you'll be blessed. But if I tell you to tell them what they got to do and you don't tell them, their blood will be on your hands. So we've got to tell the truth. We've got to preach the truth. We've got to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul, notice what Paul's doing. Paul's frustrated. Paul's had it up to here. Paul is done. He then says, I'm clean. I preach the gospel to you. Paul is confident that he's told them what they need to do. Seeing as how they refused it, Paul actually turns his back on them and declares, he says, uh, I'm only going to preach to the Gentiles from now on. Verse 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice. One that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue, meaning he lived right next to the church, if in fact his house may have been a part of the church. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So the ruler of the synagogue that Paul's been preaching to waits until Paul says, My God, have mercy, I could preach right now. My Lord. Every day he's going to the synagogue and he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They make fun of him. They blaspheme him, Brother Pete, until the point he shakes his raiment off against them and says, rain on y'all. That ain't me talking now. Don't be getting mad at me looking at me all mean and stuff, scaring me. But the Bible says, and Crispus the chief ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his house. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that the word will go out and will not return void but will accomplish that which it was intended to do. So understand this, we've got a message to preach no matter how we feel in the flesh. And also understand this, that it, they may not respond on our time but what happened when Paul left? That old boy said, I ain't passing up this chance. And he followed Paul, believed on the Lord with all of his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So he departed from the synagogue and went to stay with a man that worshipped God, lived right next to the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house. So the work in the synagogue was not completely in vain. And many of the Corinthians heard the word. Everybody said, heard the word. And believed. God have mercy. God have mercy. Eternity, Brother David, hangs upon what we preach over this pulpit. Eternity rests upon receiving the word of God. If I didn't believe this was important, I'd be on the riverbank somewhere this morning. Amen. If I didn't believe this was important, 
I had a homestead in the uptown and eat me some biscuits and gravy and scrambled eggs. And, and yes, I'd eat sausage and bacon and hog jaw. But I believe this is important. I believe the word of God is important. It's what changes lives. It's what causes you to be born again. It's the word of God that saves you. It's the word of God that when you hear it, faith is given birth to. Because the Bible said faith come by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Brother Pete, the Bible said hearing believed and were baptized. What did they believe? What Paul preached. And what Paul preached is the death, burial, and resurrection. He that believeth, Mark chapter 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The plan is to be filled with the Holy Ghost when you believe the word of God. And there's nothing more important in your life than making heaven. Than making heaven. They heard. Faith comes by hearing. They believed. How do you know they believed? Because they obeyed the preaching of the word. And now I said everything I've said to get to this verse are these next two verses. My whole lesson, is my whole message. I had somebody call me this week. Uh, Sister Sharon McAnulty uh, called me this week and said, Melissa and her husband been going to church somewhere else, and they're not real happy with it, and they, they want to visit here. So she said, uh, does Brother GL teach or preach on Sunday mornings? I said, I have no idea. I, I don't know what you call what I do. I'm just having fun. That's all I know. As I'm enjoying preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what more I'm enjoying is I see hungry souls. I see hungry souls, people that are interested. Verse number 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Wednesday night I taught on two, there's two words. The Logos word and the Rhema word. This is a rhema word. This is a specific word. Now, you've got to help me this morning. You've got to help me, okay? Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision. Here's what the Lord said. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. Okay. This is a rhema word. This is a specific word. It's for Paul. Now, Brother Rice, we got to understand something, that the Lord God Almighty knows everything. The Bible says that, that his word even is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. He knows everything. The Lord is not going to show up and tell you, don't be afraid, unless you're afraid or there's danger of you becoming afraid. The, there, there's not going to be any chance, Marcus. There's not going to be any chance that the Lord speaks to Paul and Paul says, you got the wrong guy. Bad connection. I, these stupid phones, I don't know what. They just, they don't do what you tell them to do. Brother Billy, when the Lord speaks to you, he speaks to you with all the knowledge of the whole created world. He speaks to you with the knowledge of knowing everything you think, everything you know, everything you've ever done every day the minute you were born. Matter of fact, I preached to you a couple times ago that he told Jeremiah, I knew you before you were born. So he speaks to Paul, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. A rhema word, a specific word. Why is the Lord speaking that to Paul? Because there is a fear that has risen up in him. Now, we know what Paul is feeling by what the Lord says to him. We know there's something bothering Paul. Something that he was afraid of or something that was going to cause him to be afraid. And then the Lord said, but speak and hold not thy peace. The Lord's directive, now hear me right now, the Lord's directive is, oh my God, have mercy. I feel like I'm about to explode. His directive 
was straight to the area where Paul's got a problem. Be not afraid, but speak. Something has happened, Brother, Paul, uh, Brother David, to Paul that is causing him to question whether he even needs to preach anymore. Say, how do you know that? Because the Lord said, be not afraid, but speak. So he knows that Paul in his mind has been thinking, maybe I'm wasting my time. That's already happened before in the Bible. This ain't the first time it's happened. Jeremiah said, I ain't preaching to him no more. I ain't saying nothing to him no more. I'm done. But then he said, but his word was like a fire shut up in my bones. And I couldn't hold it in. I couldn't contain it. So it happened. Preachers are just people. Pastors are just people. Apostles are just people. And the Lord is speaking to Paul and saying, don't be afraid. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. Let's see where Paul is and where he's been. He's been to Athens and he had little results. He came to Corinth preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, preaching the coming of the Messiah to a people that were looking for him. A people that needed to hear the word. In this city of Corinth, they need to hear the word worse than anybody in the whole world. And they refused to hear him with the exception of a few. The fear that God is speaking of is the fear of not being effective. The fear of not seeing people changed. It is rooted in a faith that begins to decrease because of the problems in life. How many know that life can hurt your faith? Any man, woman, boy, or girl that has the heartbeat of God, and Paul did, any human being that has been filled with the Holy Ghost and has the heartbeat of God will get discouraged when it appears that you're not getting it done. It's the greatest tool the enemy will use against us. It's the greatest uh, accusation that he'll come with against us. And you will begin to think, don't nobody want to hear it. Don't nobody care about hearing the word of God. Begin to get discouraged. Paul's response in Athens and in the synagogue at Corinth, his response in both places was what? What did he do in Athens? Come on now. I told you. He left. What did he do in the synagogue? He left. And now he's going to preach to the whole city of Corinth, all of these Gentiles, and the Lord speaks to him. Instead of leaving, becoming a habit, or losing sight of the goal becoming a habit, the Lord spoke to him and said, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. Now you've got to pay close attention right here. The very first line of 18 and 10 says, For I am with thee. Not I was with you. Not I am going to be with you. I am with you. This word of encouragement, saints of God, changes everything. Because when the I am is with you, chains are loosed. Miracles happen. Devils flee. Prison bars are broken. Nations are born. Promises are fulfilled. Signs and wonders accompany the deliverance of God's people. And the most beautiful expression of faith I could share with you is when the I am is present, a stuttering, Murdering outcast become the mightiest deliverer of the people of God because the I am was present. Moses said, who do I tell him sent me? I am that I am has sent you. 
God is the I am. And his first words to Paul was, for I am with thee. Okay, now you got to see this for a minute. And no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. The Lord is my protector. Now we got to understand something. The Lord is not an advocate of violence. Please stay with me, please. I know I'm going long. But I'm not sorry. If you want to hear me preach short, Brother Zip said just come to a wedding. <laughs> the Lord is not an advocator of violence. He's not telling Paul, if you have trouble, I'm going to get an army up. He's not telling him. He's not telling him. Notice he said, for I have much people in this city. He's not telling him, don't be afraid because I got an army just waiting. If somebody says something to you, they're going to boom, lower the boom. That's not what he's saying. How do I know that's not what he's saying? Because as I told you last Sunday, when, when they're about to go crucify him, Peter cut off that guy's ear. Jesus picked it back up and healed him. Paul and Silas a couple chapters ago are thrown in jail, Brother Rice. They're beaten on their backs. They're put in the inner stocks. They begin to pray and sing praises unto God. And at midnight, a jail, uh, an earthquake came and broke the jail open, and they were set free. The Lord ain't scared of nothing that people can do to you. And not only that, the jailer, who most likely was the one that beat them, ends up getting saved with all of his household. The Lord ain't interested in destroying people. He's not interested in beating people down. He came to save people. That's his whole reason for existence. That's the whole reason he died and gave his life. He's not looking to beat people down. Notice this. For I have much people in this city. So what did he tell Paul? Be not afraid, but speak. At first glance, it appears that God's saying, if it's not enough to know that I'm with you. Remember his first thing, Brother Billy says, and I'm with you. For I am with thee. He really, if there's going to be a conflict, he didn't need to say anything else. Okay, it's, we're not talking about a conflict between people. We're talking about a conflict Paul's having within himself. Because at first glance it appears that God's saying, if it's not enough to know that I am with you, then there are many people that are mine in this city. They'll help you. That's, that's not what he's saying. That goes against the very nature of who God is. He doesn't fail. He doesn't need any help. If he is for you, don't quit because you'll win. The much people, he said, I've got much people in this city. I've already told you what kind of city it was. What I haven't shared with you is this is Paul's first trip to this city. He's never been here before. It's his first missionary journey. These people are heathens. These people are whoremongers. These people are prostitutes, and it's become an honorable way of life. They need the power of God to sweep into them. The much people that he belonged to God, he said, I have much people in this city. The people, the much people that God is talking about is not a people as they are right now. The much people that belong to God is a glimpse of this city through the eyes of God. This is a city of immoral, perverted, impure, false worshiping, deceived, flesh pe pleasing people that very soon Brother David, he said, don't be afraid. Hold not your peace, but speak. Don't be afraid. You got to say something. You got to preach. You got to share the word. Don't be afraid. Don't shut up. For I have much people in this city. Because very soon, they're a whole. They may have not listened. They may have not listened to you in Athens. They may have not listened to you in the synagogue. But there's some people in this city. There are some people in this city that the way they're living ain't doing it for them. 
There's some people in this city that already belong to me, but they just don't know it yet. And that's why I'm telling you, that's why I'm telling you, don't keep your mouth shut. Don't be afraid. You're doing a good work. You're doing a good job. There are people out there. Saints of God, there may be a lot of things that we can do. We may sometimes change the style of music that we have. We may change our carpet and change our walls. But one thing that we cannot do is shut our mouths because it is the speaking of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the preaching of the gospel that still changes lives. Just because he don't change this one doesn't mean he's not going to change the next one. The Bible says, and be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. We may do a lot of things in our lives, but the one thing we can never do is give up on preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of men that will try to stop you. Because I am with you. Speak and hold not thy peace. Because there are many. There are many in this city. There are many that they don't look like that they're going to listen. They don't look like that they're interested. They don't act like that they're hungry. The trouble is they don't know. If you tell them, they're going to obey it. If you speak the word, they're going to listen. Let's stand. Discouragement is the greatest enemy of the church. And we see here Paul was discouraged, but the Lord sent him a word. There are much people, much people that are hungry, much people. Don't be afraid. Don't be backwards. Nobody's going to hurt you for I'm with you. And there are much people, much people. It's a rhema word. Keep speaking, keep preaching, keep testifying. I have much people in this city. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Deliverer. Jesus is the hope. That's why, saints of God, we can't get to looking down and mealy-mouthed. We can't get discouraged. If we're discouraged, we've still got to do the only thing we know how to do, and that's praise God. Our lips have got to speak of the goodness of God. Our lips have got to speak of the revival that's taking place in our church. Our lips have got to speak of the blessings of the Lord. Yeah, opposition's going to come. Yes, discouragement's going to come. But there's a rhema word for you. There's a specific word for you. Don't shut your mouth. Don't hold your peace. Because we still have the gospel. We still have the power of God within us. That if we speak it out to change a life. That's why the Holy Ghost has got to flow through us. The enemy's going to try to discourage you. The enemy's going to try to beat you down. I battle with it. Brother Billy, I battle with it on a daily basis. On a daily basis. But I've learned to begin to remind the devil. Listen, listen, Dub, are you stupid or what? This is happening in our church. This is happening in our church. This one's coming to church. This one's interested. This one's showing up. This one's the, the Lord's touching here. The Lord's healing here. Who are you to try to tell me it ain't working? Huh? And the Lord said, be not afraid. Open your mouth. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, saints. I know the kids are coming out.